Welcome to the Circling the Bases podcast. I'm Connor Rogers alongside DJ Short, and we are also joined by Scott Pianaski of Yahoo Sports. Boys, we got a big one today. Starting pitching, yep. maybe the beefiest preview we will have to do here. Not only uh, is there a lot to sort through in terms of your rankings, which we will get to at the end of the show, but so much movement this offseason, yeah. DJ. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think actually this is the deepest position in fantasy. We've said that for outfield or shortstop. But I think this year, from a fantasy perspective, where in the past maybe we saw two or three starting pitchers coming off the board in the first round, you don't really need to this year, and that's because of the depth of the position. So it is fascinating. Scott, when you look at the starting pitching market, what stands out to you big picture-wise? Yeah, this is like we, we talk about in fantasy football, the running backs are the keys to the kingdom. The starting pitchers are the keys to the fantasy kingdom in baseball because they're enigmatic. They get hurt. They change pitches. They change catchers. They change pitching coaches. And we got a lot of guys who are in their mid to late 30s who are high draft choices this year. So a lot to get through. This is the position you're going to spend the most time doing your prep work on. And if you end up drafting well or even picking up well during the season, this will probably determine how you do in your fantasy year. Before we get to all the transactions and movement on the major league market, a reminder that every season is draft season. Get your Roto World Draft Guide bundle today and dominate your football, baseball, and basketball drafts packed with profiles, rankings, projections. Order today and get all three Roto World Draft Guides for the price of two. Plus, use promo code BUNDLE5 and save an extra $5 at checkout. And one reminder here this is the Roto World Draft Guide. You do not want to miss this, but we are here today to help you out if you did. So let's get into the transactions and start with really the tier one stuff that I don't think a lot of people miss, but is still extremely noteworthy. The Rangers signed Jacob deGrom. He leaves the New York Mets after spending his entire career with them for a five-year, $185 million deal. The Mets replaced DeGrom by signing Justin Verlander to a two-year, $86 million deal. And then the last one of these true tier one moves, Carlos Rodon signs with the Yankees for a six-year, $162 million deal here, DJ. From a fantasy perspective, which one do you think moves the needle the most? I think, honestly, I think it's Rodon. I, I think going to the Yankees, the win potential there, you look at what Rodon's done over the past two seasons. He has the highest strikeout rate in the majors among pitchers with at least 300 innings pitched. So I think he's a top 10 starting pitcher to me with the win potential there. I think for Verlander, DeGrom, it's more kind of lateral uh, as far as quality of team and lineup and that sort of thing. But I, I think Rodon is a top 10 starting pitcher. Scott, when you look at these big three, what, what's your perspective as well? Yeah, I'm a little bit more nervous about Rodon just going from San Francisco to New York. Or San Francisco, a great pitcher park. New York is a home run haven. I realize the left-handed hitters don't hit home runs off Carlos Rodon, but getting the big contract and going to a market he hasn't been in before, it just makes me a little bit nervous. And obviously with DeGrom and with Verlander, we're talking about DeGrom's in his mid-30s. He's had a bunch of injury problems the last few years, and Verlander steps into his age 40 season. So it's going to test your stomach to, to, pitch a, to pick one of those guys in the early rounds because they're at any point you know, they, they could break down the Grom especially I think the Grom might be the trickiest call on the entire pitching board this year I think he brings up an interesting point here Scott so with hitters usually we're picking 25 year olds 26 27 year olds who are in their peak so to speak pitchers the aging curve is all over the place you can be a 40 year old pitcher and be a second rounder it's pretty amazing yeah it's not when you're in redraft mode it doesn't matter for yeah. these guys these guys are at the top of their game and obviously yeah. top Cy young contenders yeah. as well a couple moves that are just a notch down chris bassett leaves the mets he was really the steady eddie of their rotation last year made all of his starts and was effective for the team that earned him a three-year 63 million dollar deal with the blue jays and then this one dj is, you know, before we even got on, I said to you, this is the unknown right here. The Mets hope to replace Bassett's production with Kodai Senga coming over from Japan on that five-year, $75 million deal. Yeah, it's fascinating, and it's the unknown quantity factor. Um, I think Senga pitching in New York, the hype, especially with this ghost fork pitch. <laughs> They're that milking we're that one. It's we're hearing, awesome. <laughs> we're hearing all about so far uh, during camp with the Mets. I wonder if that hype's going to push him a little bit beyond where I'm comfortable taking him. 
But given that unknown quantity factor, maybe he enjoys some early success uh, throwing hitters off balance. We'll see. I, I think you could either get a tremendous value or maybe you'll be a little bit disappointed. But you're right. I think he's one of the most fascinating pitchers in baseball this year. Scott, how do you handle projecting somebody like Kodai Senga? We've seen him, seen him dominate overseas for a long, long time. He makes the big move. We know he spent off seasons at driveline here. So this isn't a total culture shock, but still a gigantic move. And I would assume a pretty tough variable to figure out. Yeah, certainly an unknown because the cultures are different, not just the, the living culture, but remember the baseball culture, right? Sure. In Japan, you basically, you own one day of the week and that's when you pitch. And, yeah. and now he's going into a team ostensibly with a five-man rotation. So do they end up, does he end up being somebody, maybe they skip him a start here or there. Are they maybe looking at 150 or 160 innings for his first season over. And because DJ mentioned hype, I, I'm, I try to be allergic to buzz. So if... I'm going to let the market price me into Senga. If people are really eager to draft him, if he does something notable in spring training and it rises his ADP by a round or two, I'll probably step away from him. If people, for whatever reason, don't want to touch him and the, the price is right for him on draft day, I'm going to let the market kind of push me to how I play him because, again, an uncertain quality quantity. Now, the Mets are lucky. They have such a deep rotation. They don't need him to be out front, right? He's not going to be the opening day starter. He's not going to be plastered over the cover of the media guide. So at least that gives him a nice, safe stepping off point. But I'm not going to be, he's not going to be a proactive pick for me in 2023. The last tier of transactions here, guys, the Jamison Tyone, Taiwan Walker, Pablo Lopez's of the world. Not the guys that got ace money, but are obviously are very impactful in the fantasy world. Which one stands out to you? So Tyone, I think, is interesting with the Cubs. And what I think is interesting about this situation is when the Cubs were pursuing him in free agency, they presented him with this plan of trying a new pitch grip with his slider and how they think it could have benefited him moving forward as far as swings and misses and that sort of thing. So he adopted this slider grip during the offseason, messing around with it this spring. We'll see how he looks in games. But if he can add more swings and misses... He could be a really solid mid-rotation starter in a standard mixed league. So I'm going to watch him closely this spring. Scott, in this third tier, who are you looking at? Yeah, Tyone is interesting to me too because you can finally – We've been waiting for him to be an ace. I think we've all kind of given up that ghost, but he may be your fifth or sixth fantasy starter. He's familiar with the National League Central for all that time he spent with Pittsburgh. I'm interested to see how he changes his pitch mix this year. I'm going to go with somebody a little bit cheaper. Ross Stripling was was picked up by the Giants, and they've just been right so often with their reclamation products. Remember, it was they who signed Rodome when nobody really wanted to touch him when the White Sox, for some reason, walked away from his option. I'm not saying Stripling's going to be as impactful as Rodone was, but with a big park, a plus defense stripling is a guy i'd love to get as one of my final pick you know you can probably get him outside of pick 300 in some leagues and i think he could be a great pickup again i want to bet on what the giants are betting on we've hinted at a couple different adps in the transaction segment and let's move on to buy fade where we actually get into why adp matters so much it's not that these guys are saying i'm out on this player because i don't like him i don't like where he's being uh, where he's coming off the board right now so let's start with the fades in that perspective dj who are you fading out of the pitchers uh jacob Degrom is my first fade uh, and i i hate to say that because i you know i love him as a pitcher as a mets fan um but i think at this point the risk is just so high for someone who's going to be you know maybe the fifth or sixth starter off the board in a mixed league i believe in the ability obviously when he's healthy otherworldly pitcher but you look at the past two years 156 and a third innings combined over the past two years last year was the stress reaction in his scapula and his shoulder but the year before that back lat forearm elbow issues he could very well pitch 150 innings and be an ace be ridiculous or he could pitch 40 innings and we barely hear from him this year uh, i think it's just way too risky for me yeah and it has to scare you when spring training starts and the first thing you hear yeah. is that they're going to give him a little time yeah the side soreness i mean just, we're used to that as yes. mets fans where it's it gets downplayed Tradition. it turns into yep. something else maybe this will be nothing but it's already a reminder this early in the spring the risk that the, that is present with him scott who tops your fade list of the starting pitching market yeah, before I get to that, I just want to echo what DJ said. I mean, 
I used to joke that Steven Strasburg, his last name should be Strasburg because of just what you're you're buying into six or seven months of stress when you drafted Strasburg. And Jacob deGrom is just maybe a higher version of that because we know his upside is the best pitcher in fantasy baseball, the best pitcher in real baseball. But the moment you draft him, you've drafted seven months of concern, seven months of, oh, wait a minute, did he pull up on that last pitch? Did, is he holding his elbow? Is he holding his shoulder? And because his ADP is still very expectant, I'm not going to draft into deGrom. And I hate saying that because he's my favorite pitcher to pitch, to watch when he's healthy um but i'm, I'm not going to touch him at, at current adp and that's why i'm out adp is why i'm out on hunter green who's going at pick 108 he had six great starts in the second half of the year but he had a home run problem last year cincinnati's a bad team i know wins can be fluky but i'll take a contending team to get me more wins than a losing team like the cincinnati reds it's a homer friendly ballpark a lot of people are into green because he's a, kind of the, the buzzy new toy on the mound and his adp to me is crazy right now i'm not going to go near him at his current price any more fades dj before we look into a little more positive note on the buyers yeah so i've got a couple i'll go with alec manoa here you look at the era last year 2.24 over 31 starts very impressive, but advanced metrics, let's just go with XERA, has a full run higher, 3.31. You look at the strikeout rate, it's not fantastic when you, when you compare him to fantasy aces. Had 180 strikeouts and 196 and two-thirds innings, so doesn't compare to the other aces there. Also, we know the Blue Jays are changing their ballpark dimensions. How does that affect all of their starters moving forward? His ADP right now is 69.12 on NFC, just a little too early for me. The other one is Tyler Glasnow with mm -hmm. the Rays. ADP inside the top 100 right now. Came back from Tommy John surgery late last season. We know the stuff's great. It's kind of like the Grom. The stuff is amazing when he's on the field. I question if he can actually stay on the mound for a full season. Has ne hasn't pitched more than 88 innings since 2018. It's five years ago. He's never thrown it's more crazy. than 111 and two thirds innings in a season. So I just don't think it's gonna justify that ADP. Scott, do you share the same concerns on those guys? Oh, yeah. Glass now I have just three question marks next to him. His high for his career is 111 innings. He's never yep. gone past that. As DJ said, he's only gone past, what, 80 innings once, and he's ADP 84 right now. I think that's ridiculous. It should, he should be going four or five rounds later. We know the upside, but the downside is he could, he could be somebody you're dropping two months into the season. And that's how I feel about Chris Sale. Right now his ADP is around 150. He's done nothing in the last two seasons into an age 34 season. This is the worst Red Sox team on paper that we've seen in a while. Pitches in a park that's very offensively friendly. I'm glad Chris Sale got paid. I joke that when the Red Sox offered him that extension, he must have run all the red lights and driven like 115 miles an hour to go sign it because all he's done is, is really been an albatross since then. I mean, a hell of a first half of a career. He was on a Hall of Fame trajectory. I'm not touching glass now at that ADP, and I am not, I'm not going to draft Chris Sale. You could even push him back 40 or 50 picks. He's still not going to be on my board. On a more positive note, Scott, let's start with you for the buyers. What ADPs are, have been a pleasant surprise to you? Well, why do we like drafting early? You can get a player who's mispriced. And right now, Hunter Brown is mispriced in Houston. He's going to find his way into this rotation. He may not have a spot on paper right now, but Lance McCullers has had a setback. So outside of the top 280 p this could rise 50 or 60 picks. He's got electric stuff. And he's going to, again, you know, if you're a number six starter on a team's depth chart, you get to figure somebody gets hurt. We can't trust McCullers anyway. Hunter Brown is grossly mispriced. I mentioned Stripling also earlier around pick ADP 300 right now. I think that may rise two or three rounds when you get drafting in the teeth of March. But let's try to take advantage of those opportunities while they're available now. Another Astros pitcher for me, Christian Javier. I think there's been a lot of talk of Framber Valdez being the new ace of the Astros. I think it could be Christian Javier. We saw how great he was during the postseason last year and really made some impressive strides with his control last season, which I think was the most impressive thing about him last year. And if you look at the batting average against on his slider over the past two seasons, the lowest in the majors, lower than even Jacob deGrom, I think he takes that next leap this season. I'm really excited to see what he can do. And one I'm looking at in sort of mid to late rounds uh, this season is Dustin May with the Dodgers. Now, he came back from Tommy John surgery last year, had some mixed results. Control wasn't great, but we see that, you know, with pitchers coming back from Tommy John surgery. Fastball velocity was still excellent. Plenty of swings and misses. I think he takes that leap this year. All right, we got through the top tier guys, and we will close out this show with the top 20 each from DJ and Scott. So we're not done there, but let's get into some late round flyers, guys that 
could ultimately maybe help you win your league at this point that really aren't on the radar. Who do you start with, DJ? So Grayson Rodriguez with the Orioles. Uh, we probably would have seen him last year in the majors, but he missed a lot of time. He had a grade two lat strain, came back toward the end of the season, pitched pretty well in AAA, but didn't get the call with the Orioles down the stretch. But top pitching prospect in the game. There's a chance he could make the Orioles rotation out of spring training, but they may wait a month or two, you know, to delay his service time, that sort of thing. But I think he could make an impact in mixed leagues right away. And again, this ball Orioles ballpark is different than it was in the past. It really helps out pitchers as opposed to hurts them. So I think he could be a breakout guy this season. Scott, I know you brought up Hunter Brown already. I wanted to know, though, are you agreeing with the hype on Grayson Rodriguez? And is there another guy in later rounds that you're interested in here? Yeah, I like the tack that the DJ was taking with the Baltimore Park, and that's going to get me to Cole Irvin right now, ADP 500. Just a really sneaky pickup. He's gone from Oakland, where fly balls go to die, to Baltimore, where fly balls go to die. I like what this Baltimore team is doing. I think they're going to be over 500 again this year. And again, look, any ball hit to the power alleys is going to be caught. It's not the Camden Yards we grew up with. So he's just a dead giveaway. Pick 500. I think that will probably go up about 100 picks. Even then, we're looking at a last round steal. And uh, DJ knows the Mets really well, so I'm curious what he thinks of Jose Quintana, who kind of fixed his career last year. He'll be at the back of a Mets rotation, a good defense, a team that's probably going to win about 95 ball games or so. He's no longer buzzy, and I realize, you know, at one point he commanded a lot in trade. He was always seen as like kind of like a quasi Cy Young contender. He's not that guy anymore. But could he win 12 to 14 games with an ERA in the mid threes, maybe a whip around 120, somebody who fills out the back of a fantasy staff nicely, and you can get him outside pick 300 in Yahoo leagues right now? I think Carlos Carrasco fits in that same mold, mm -hmm. exactly. I think they could put up similar numbers for sure. All right, to close this out, uh, what about the guys that probably aren't making the team out of spring training, but come June, maybe July, you start to hear some buzz about a call-up a debut who are you starting with there so Andrew Painter with the Phillies I feel like he's getting so much hype right now in Phillies camp with maybe a chance to make the team but he's 19 years old I, I think it's probably unlikely <laughs> one full season under his belt I think it's unlikely he makes the opening day roster but still in that one season 1.56 ERA 155 strikeouts 25 walks and just over 100 innings the stuff's legit he's six foot seven 215 pounds kind of that future frontline starting pitcher. We will see him at some point this season, and he has a chance to dominate from the start. Scott, what do you think of that? And do you have another guy that, hey, keep an eye on your waivers going into the summer? Yeah, that, that's certainly, he. he's certainly a guy who's on my on my radar. You know, if, if I'm allowed to pick somebody who's older, I want to see what Jack Flaherty does in a comeback season. He may not start the season in the St. Louis rotation. I think he might be on the IR list, IL list to start the season. But remember, he's somebody who we saw as a, po a possible league winner pick, a possible Cy Young pick. I want to have him stashed on my IL if he doesn't open the season in St. Louis. Before we get to the top 20s, a reminder, download the Roto World app to receive breaking player news all season long. Stay ahead of the competition by favoriting players on your roster. Get the latest injury updates, player news, and much more delivered right to your phone. It's available in your app store today. Starting pitching rankings. Feels like the grand finale of rankings. So much to soar through. Uh, DJ has a top 20. Scott has a top 20. DJ, we'll start and we'll go a little faster for 20 through 11 before we get into the top 10. Who do you start with at uh, your top 20? So 20 for me is Max Freed. And I, I think the thing that separates him from some of the other fantasy aces, we want to see that innings total go up. Has yet to throw 200 innings in his career. Made some awesome strides with his control last season. So I, I like him a lot, but I want to see him get to that 200 inning threshold uh, in 2023. Shane Bieber, I have 19. And the reason I'm doing that is because we're going to have this balanced schedule this year in Major League Baseball. So I wonder, not pitching against the AL Central as much, how that impacts, impacts the ERA. Maybe it bumps him over three. We'll see. Zach Wheeler, I might be underrating here, but we know he had that form, forearm issue down the stretch last year. The velocity was kind of up and down during the postseason. So he has to answer some questions for me this spring. Luis Castillo, I have at number 17. Now getting to pitch a full season in Seattle, I think leaving Cincinnati is going to be big for him. Had a 2.99 ERA last year. Could do even better this season. Zach Gallen, he was awesome in the second half last year. Had that, what, 44-inning scoreless streak. Uh, leaned into his curveball usage last season. I think he could be a fantasy ace, maybe even a Cy Young contender 
this season. Christian Javier, I already went over his case, why I like him as a breakout pick. Shohei Otani, I feel like he gets underrated as a pitcher because of what he does as a hitter. But to me, he's right on the cusp of being a fantasy ace. Maybe he doesn't have that workload of other fantasy aces, but was more efficient last season, like him a lot. Kevin Gossman at 13 has struck out 200 batters in each of the past two seasons. Uh, so he's right there in the cusp of the top 12 starters. Julio Urias, for me, very efficient. Strikeout rate might not be there, but you know he's going to get a lot of wins with the Dodgers. Uh, so I'm a big fan of him. Max Scherzer I have at number 11. I mean, the fact with him is just how many innings can he throw? He hasn't thrown 200 innings since 2018, so it's been a little while. When he's healthy, though, he's going to be great. Scott, looking at your top 20, who do you start with, and where do you differ from DJ's 20 to 11? Yeah, you're going to hear a lot of the same names. I have Zach Gallon at number 20, but, uh, you know, DJ had him a few slots higher, and, and maybe I, I need to revisit that rank. It's a good defense in Arizona, and that park is misunderstood. It's actually a pitcher favoring park over the last few seasons. Alec Manoa and Kevin Gossman, I have back-to-back -back at 19 and 18. If not for the dimension changes, I'd probably have them higher. I think Gossman is better served to be okay because he's got that ground ball tilt. Carlos Rodon is my 17 pitcher, which means I'll probably be out on him. Just a little bit nervous, the big contract in that homer-friendly park. Dylan Cease, my number 16 pitcher, he needs to get that walk rate down, and I don't think he can match his current ADP. I'm going to be out on him where I have him ranked against the market. I'm just concerned he walks too many guys. Luis Castillo, DJ outlined it. Look, Cincinnati is hellish for pitchers. Seattle is a good pitching ballpark. I really believe in a lot of the moves this team has made. They made the playoffs last year. I think they'll be back in the playoffs this season. Julio Urias at 14. He breaks the ERA estimators. He always has that better ERA than the components that suggest. When you do that enough times i start to believe it's part of a skill that you own so i'll be happy to draft him proactively shohei otani remember in yahoo he's two different players hitter otani pitcher otani probably otani's last year with the angels do the angels say the heck with it let's just lean into him mm. give him a heavier workload he may not be in our team next year he may be traded in the middle of the season for all we know so you might get 20 or 30 more innings than you expected with otani always a difficult guy to rank i have him at 13 zach wheeler's such a dependable strikeout guy i believe in the phillies infrastructure even without bryce harper for about half the season i have him at 12. Now, DJ made a great point about Shane Bieber. He's my number 11 pitcher, so I like him more than DJ does. I know it's a so-so fastball, but his off-speed stuff is outstanding. His slider, he's got a great strikeout rate. Won't get as much of the AL Central as we're used to with the schedule more balanced this year, but I like that Cleveland defense, and I don't care that I, he doesn't light it up. He's not going to throw 100-mile-an-hour fastballs. I'm not concerned about that. I will draft Shane Bieber proactively. 10-6, to six, this is where the stakes get a little higher. These are typically your frontline fantasy starters, yep. most likely going to be in number one for whatever team they're drafted to. Where do you start? So we're going to start out here with Carlos Rodon. I, I kind of already went over uh, why I like him a lot with the Yankees. Just a reliable strikeout guy, and it, it's pretty amazing. I think Scott mentioned this earlier, the White Sox uh, giving up on him, not even giving him a qualifying offer, but I think he answered some questions about his health last season. Uh, and to me, he's a top 10 starter. Uh, Shane, McClanahan, Shane McClanahan, I have at number nine. And he was great during the first half last year. He was probably the breakout pitcher in Major League Baseball. Second half, not so much. Uh, dealt with a shoulder issue during the second half as well. Strikeouts went down. Walks went up. So he has some questions to answer for me, but I still think he's a top 10 starter. Spencer Strider was the fastest pitcher in baseball history uh, to make it to 200 strikeouts in a season, and he topped Randy Johnson for that metric. So that's, that's pretty impressive. Uh, we know he dealt with a lat issue down the stretch last year, but plenty of time to get healthy during the offseason. I'm very, very interested to see what he can do over a full season. Justin Verlander, defeating Father Time, just turned 40 years old, but uh, you wouldn't know it after what he did last year returning from Tommy John surgery. Am I expecting a sub-2 ERA? Uh, probably not, but I still think uh, he's going to be great this year. Aaron Nola uh, uh, improved the ERA last year. The control was great. Uh, for me, he's a workhorse. Fantasy workhorse, workhorse all the way. Uh, 235 strikeouts last year. I think he just checks every box for a fantasy ace. Scott, I know your 10-6 to 6 starts with a bit of a surprise, so break it down for the people. Yeah, 10, I have Jacob deGrom, and, and I have my notes is scares the expletive out of me. I, <laughs> I just don't think I have the nerve to draft deGrom. Maybe it's because I've been burned by him the last couple of years. 
every pitcher is an injury risk, but I think there's just extra risk baked into him. So I'm not going to get him where I have him slotted. Shane McClanahan could be a Cy Young contender. We know the Rays always have a plus defense. He's into an age 26 season. These are the years to get invested. I have him at nine. I could conceivably move him up. I have the two old guy Mets at eight and seven Verlander into his age 40 season Scherzer into his age 38 season. You could really rank those in any order you want. Uh, are we comfortable drafting these guys in their mid late thirties, you know, even into 40 for Verlander. That's a kind of a personal choice for everybody. But I rank them where I may get them on some teams. Spencer Strider. I have at six. The only concern for me, because man, he did pile up the strikeouts. He's only a two pitch guy. We always talk about a starting pitcher needs three pitches, but if the two pitches are dominant enough, maybe it doesn't matter. Atlanta is built to be a 95 win team against Strider has also only done it once, which can make us con concerned at times. I have him at SP six. The market may have him a little bit loftier than that. So I don't think I'll draft Strider as often as maybe a normal manager would, but still a, a pretty good real estate for him as my SP six. Finally, DJ, your top five fantasy starting pitchers for the 2023 season. So number five, I have Brandon Woodruff, and I think he actually goes underrated because he's on the same staff as Corbin Burns. But you look at what he's done over the past three seasons. I mean, he has a sub three ERA in that time, and he's legit. Uh, I think he could push for 200 strikeouts with a full season of health. And to me, I think he's one of the best pitchers in the game, even though he doesn't necessarily get the recognition for it. I have Jacob DeGrom at number four. I, I said earlier I'm probably not going to touch him in drafts, but that's true. Uh, but potential, he could be the number one fantasy starter when it's all said and done. Am I gonna, going to draft him if I see him on the board You know, as the number four starter? Maybe not, but potential, he's right there. Sandy Alcantara, I, I think what's interesting about him is that he doesn't have the strikeout rate to match those other fantasy aces, but in terms of pure volume, He's going to throw more innings than anyone, assuming that he's healthy. He pitches deep in the games. So he still got to 207 strikeouts last year, even though he didn't have that electric strikeout percentage. I think wins are a little shaky there with the Marlins, but uh, I think he's legit as well. Uh, Garrett Cole, I think ERA is always going to be the tricky one uh, with Cole pitching in Yankee Stadium. We've seen those days where he's just off. He's given up home runs, but when it's all said and done, you know, he puts up 250 strikeouts, so you can't complain about that. And Corbin Burns, which is fascinating. We've seen over the past week that the Brewers actually took this guy to arbitration and <laughs> and angered him in the process. Not great. <laughs> yeah, not great. But we'll see how much longer Burns actually pitches for the Brewers. But for me, he's the best pitcher in the game. He's the most reliable fantasy starter in the game. What he's done over the past three seasons, just the transformation that he's had has just been remarkable. Scott, how does your top five differ? And most importantly, overall, just how does it stack up? Yeah, a lot of the same names. Uh, I think we have the same top three. I have Austin Nola at five. I think he was DJ's number six pitcher. The, the problem with Nola is that the defense has never really been great in Philadelphia, and he is around the plate so much that he's going to allow contact. We know you can't shift this year, which is going to be a concern with some guys who pitch to contact. So I, I'm happy to draft Nola, but he's not necessarily a target for me. Brandon Woodruff at number four. Are we finally going to get 180, 190, 200 innings? Those numbers have come down, right? We used to want 250 inning horses. That's a dead issue now. I'd love to see 185 innings of Woodruff, and he'll need it to justify my SP4 ranking. Alcantara, as DJ mentioned, not a strikeout god, but because he's going to throw so many innings, he'll get you strikeouts off of volume. And he pitches to so much weak contact. You know, all those ground outs are weak outs or because of things he does with sequencing with the quality of his stuff so i don't care that he doesn't have the greatest strikeout per nine i will draft him aggressively even after a cy young season isn't it crazy that garrett cole's never had a cy young season maybe it's the home run problem but he's a horse he's going to strike out 220 230 guys every season and again you know wins are fluky but I'll take wins on a New York Yankees team over, you know, a 75 or an 80 win team. At some point, Garrett Cole's just going to win 20 games and win a Cy Young. Why not this season? And isn't it funny? Cor Corbin Burns goes to arbitration. The Brewers have to talk the guy down. And he's number one on a lot of fantasy <laughs> boards, including my board, including DJ's board. Into an age 28 season, the Brewers still fancy themselves a contender. I know the divisional maybe uh, the divisional matchups don't mean as much because the schedule's a little bit more balanced, but still. I want him pitching against the Cubs. I want him pitching against the Pirates. And I think Milwaukee, maybe they won't have Burns for the long haul. I think they'll have him for the balance of this season. Perfectly happy to take him in the second round of a fantasy draft. And fellows, that wraps up another episode of Circling the Bases. The Beast, starting pitching, top 20s from each. 
Uh, for Scott Pianowski, DJ Short, I'm Connor Rogers. We'll talk to you soon.